Oh man, uh, it's great to have you guys with us. It's always so awkward to have uh, that happen, but uh, we're so glad that you're joining us. We want to welcome you from wherever you are tuning in. We want to welcome those who are joining in from the barn. Go ahead and give yourselves a hand if you're watching this from the barn right now. We're glad to have you guys be a part of this today. If you are in the parking lot, uh, go ahead and honk those horns. Let us know that you're here. We're glad to have you tuning in today as well. And if you're joining us online, as Pastor GJ said, go ahead and like and share and give us a thumbs up. Let us know that you're tuning in online. And uh, we are so thankful for however you are engaging with us this morning. And I'm so excited as we next weekend uh, have our first in-person service back in this room uh, for several months. It's going to be awesome. We cannot wait to be back together again next weekend. Well, I want you guys to open up in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. And if you have a Bible, grab that with you. Grab on an app or somewhere. Open up to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to challenge us to two things today. I want to challenge us in this season to make sure that we are rooted in the Word of God. And number two, that we are looking at the world through a biblical worldview, uh, the lens of the Bible. Um, I just want to pause for a second and just acknowledge, and I just feel like saying, like, hey, like, oh my goodness, like, welcome to life in 2020. It's just unbelievable how many things are changing and what is happening in our world and in our lives. And I just want to acknowledge like this is a crazy and hard time for everybody. But I'm so glad that you're tuning in and leaning into what God has for us. It is so, so important. I'm glad that you're with us today. Um, let me just go ahead and pray as we jump in today. Heavenly Father, I pray that in the next few moments, God, you would use your word to speak to our hearts. And God, I pray that you'd use it to root us and give us a foundation that is firm and secure in you. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for who you are. Just help us to get a greater glimpse of that today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, and we were hanging out at my house. Um, for some reason, somehow, I was in charge of the kids, and we had some friends over, so I was in charge of our kids, and I was in charge of their kids, and there was a couple of kids, we were hanging out in the living room, and one of the other kids, the other family's kids, uh, she was about three or four years old, um, she was doing something that wasn't safe, and uh, you know, I'm not really, I'm not her dad, obviously, and so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to correct her, how to tell her that she shouldn't do that without, you know, I, I'm not her dad, right? So uh, something that our kids, that we do with our kids, we did uh, something called a timeout right? If you do something, you have to go sit in timeout, and you have to kind of be isolated for a little while. Well, she kept doing this thing, and I said, okay. I said, if you do it again, you're going to have to sit in timeout. And she kind of looks at me, and she kind of looks around at her siblings and the other kids in the room, and I said, okay, if you do that again, you're going to have to sit in timeout. And she basically, again, kind of looks at me, and she looks at her sister and says, what are you doing? She didn't have a clue who I was, and so she didn't really know what it was that I was trying to do. She basically saying, who is this guy? What is he trying to do? And what is this thing called a timeout? It's one of the stories that we continue to tell in our family. It was just a hilarious moment. But I think as we look at what's going on in our world, it can be hard to trust God if we don't know who he is. It can be hard to trust everything that's going on if we don't understand who God is so what I want to do for this, the next little while is I want us to be rooted in God's word to understand who he is. And I want to make sure we're looking at the world through a biblical worldview. See, uh, one of the examples we see in scripture is Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens and he's watching and observing the people of Greece and he's recognizing they're very religious. They, they worship so many things and they're very religious people, but they don't know about the God of the Bible. So he begins to explain to them. And I think we live in a culture that's very similar. It's not that people are not religious. People are religious, but we just don't have any focus to it. So I want to talk to us today about the God of the Bible. We want to look deeply at that. What I want to talk us, uh, have us think about is what is our worldview? How do we view the world? And every one of us has a worldview. It's the lens by which 
we view the world. And uh, you can look at it this way. I'm going to throw on a pair of, of Coast Guard sunglasses. Uh, thank you to my friend Justin for these amazing glasses. But uh, every one of us has a lens that we look at the world, the world through. And you have to recognize, my kids make fun of me for these glasses. Uh, go ahead and post in the comments if you like these glasses or not. But um, it actually likes it. <laughs> I like that it knocks down the lights a little bit for me. But every one of us looks at the world through some kind of bias, some kind of lens, and we interpret every situation through that lens. And I want to make sure and encourage us that we're looking at the world through the lens of God's word and not looking at, the, at God's word through the lens of the world. See, we choose as followers of Jesus to look at the world through the lens of faith. That's a biblical worldview, the lens of faith. And we choose how we look at the world. And here's some of the big worldview questions I want to just highlight for us. A book I've been reading lately is called A Practical Guide to Culture. And here's what it highlights. Here are worldview type issues. These are so important. Number one, origins. Where did everything come from? That's a worldview issue. Identity. What is a human being or what does it mean to be human? Number two, meaning. What is the meaning of life and what is our purpose? Number four, who determines right and wrong and what's wrong with the world and how can it be fixed? And then lastly, destiny. What happens when we die and where is history headed? These are all huge worldview kind of questions and worldview kinds of issues. And I want to encourage you to begin looking at the world through the lens of God's word and be able to understand what's going on from that vantage point. Everyone looks at the world through some kind of lens, some kind of bias. Are we looking at it through the lens of God's word? So here's the first thing that I want us to look at through that lens, and that is simply this, is that we were made in the image of God. We were made in the image of God. There's a Latin phrase called imago Dei, and it's the worldview, it's the biblical view that human beings were made specifically and specially in the image of God. This is different than other worldviews about human beings, but that is our perspective as a follower of Jesus, as Christians, that we were made in the image of God. And here's where we get that from in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, And let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, there's something about us that tells us something about God. We are image bearers. We represent God in the world. We bear God's image, and there's going to be some huge implications to this. We're going to talk about those at the end. What I want us to understand is that the Bible, and understand what this book is, this this book is a lot of things, but this book primarily, first and foremost, is a book about God. The Bible is not a history book, although it contains some history. The Bible is not a science book, although it does give us some science. Its main purpose, its main aim is to help us to know God and his glory and his splendor and his majesty and his revealed will for our lives. See, this is a worldview issue. How do you view the world? Do you view it through some other lens, or do you view it through the biblical lens? The Bible is telling us, let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I want to read these verses. These These are classic verses. You've probably heard these before. But here's what the Bible tells us. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, And darkness was over the surface of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here's what the Bible is telling us about this God. The Bible is telling us that God is self-existent and eternal. Here's what that means. That God is eternal. He always was and always will be. There's no end or no beginning to God. It's telling us that God is also self-existent. Here's what that means. God doesn't need anything or anyone else to exist. This is who God is. He exists in and of himself, by himself, without need of anything else. And God is also triune. This is telling us that God is God in three persons. One God, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is the creator, and he creates everything out of nothing. For you and I to create something, we need to have the basic raw elements, right? We need to have the core ingredients, but God doesn't even need that. He creates everything out of nothing. It all begins with God. The course of human history and world history and everything else begins with God. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, again, says this. Let me read it to us. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here's what Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says. For by him, talking about Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. John 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. See, God speaks, and He creates with His words. Everything that exists was spoken into existence by this God. And Genesis goes on to say in verses 3 through 5, let's read that. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. The Latin phrase that we get from this part of the Bible is the Latin phrase ex nihilo. Uh, It's kind of fun to say it. Feel free to say that if you want to. Um, Ex nihilo. It means literally out of nothing. God simply speaks and er, things come into existence. He says, and let there be light. Go ahead and uh, put up that first picture. God says, let there be light. And this ginormous, sorry, I, have to, I can't even speak without using words like that from movies. Uh, and this enormous fireball comes out of the mouth of God, known as the sun. Um, I love learning about these kinds of things. The sun is so huge. Go ahead and put the next, uh, the next picture up there, tech team, if you would. Do we have another sun picture? I don't know. Anyway, keep that one up there. It's amazing. Um, the sun is so big that you can take 1.3 million earths and put that in the space of the sun. 1.3 million earths in the size of the sun. Um, I read as well that uh, the sun is 99.86 of our solar system's mass. So of all the mass in our solar system, the sun is 99.86% of all of the mass that exists in our solar system. 
And this comes from the mouth of God. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the works of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they display knowledge. See, God is establishing order and purpose according to His plan and His design. We are tempted to believe that the world is random and has a mind of its own. But the Bible tells us a different story, that the world is created out of purpose and order and plan. And it's God's design. God is the one establishing. God is the one saying, this goes here, and this goes here, and this is what this is for, and this is what this is for. And all of this is within God's control. This is who God is. There's purpose and design. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, we were finishing our basement, and uh, my wife wanted me, Raylan wanted me to build some storage shelves, and uh, this, is, this is part of what, what we came up with. And it's not just random, right? There's a plan to it. There's, there's a, a structure to it. And go to go to the next picture. Here's why. Because here's what fits in these places. And if you know my personality, this makes me smile. I love seeing this. But the point is, is that there's purpose and design to it. And there's purpose and design to our world because that's how God made it to be. This is a worldview issue. Where did our world come from? We believe that it came from God, that God is overseeing it, that God designed it with purpose. Now, one of the questions that comes up in this Genesis account, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on it today, is, is this a literal six-day creation that we see in Genesis? And I'm not going to go into all the different arguments. I just want to share with you some of my thoughts and some of my perspectives. Uh, back in 2012, uh, my wife and I had the chance to go to a place called the Creation Museum in, uh, in Petersburg, Kentucky. And they ask so many great questions, and they give so many great arguments. But a lot of the questions that come up is, is our, is our earth a young earth or an old earth? Um, some other questions that come up are, is science and evolution right? Or did God really create everything in six literal days? What I want to just do is I want to just give some reason and some explanation for these things. And I, I don't, I don't this, like I said, this is not an extensive uh, study in this right now, but I just want to establish some things about what we can believe. So Genesis 1 verse 5, God's word says this, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first, what does it say? It says day. That comes from the Hebrew word yom, which in this context, and in just about every other aspect where it's translated in the Bible, it means literally the word day. So, where possible, what I want us to do is I want us to try to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And here's what we see other places in the Bible. From the Ten Commandments, we see this, Exodus chapter 20, verses 9 through 11. It says, Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord our God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, your son or daughter, your manservant or maidservant, your animals or alien with you, within your gates. For in six days, what does it say? The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in it, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the whole pattern for our seven-day work week comes from this idea that God created in this pattern as well. Also, the problem of sin, we read this in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. So the Bible seems to interpret Genesis chapter 1 as a literal six-day creation. The Bible gives us our understanding of how sin entered the world, and the theory of evolution, even theistic evolution, relies on the process of death over and over and over again. But we recognize from Scripture that sin enters through death. Uh, that, I'm sorry, that sin ushers in death. So death did not exist in the world that God created. So 
these questions are, are significant and are important. I believe that God created in a literal six days and that that's a part of the worldview that we adopt and take on and say God could have done this this way and I believe that's what scripture teaches us. There's lots of nuances and depth to those, argue, those, those discussions. I'd be glad to talk with you about that at some other point. But here's what we need to have established so far is this, that there is one God who is the creator and sustainer of all things. And he created with purpose, intentionality, and design. And we are made in his image, in the image of God. So I want to talk to you for just a few minutes. What are the implications of this? If this is true, if God is the creator of everything, here's some of the implications. Number one, there's huge implications for what it means to be a human being. What I find fascinating is that no secular humanist can answer the question of what it means to be human because they don't know why we're here. But if we truly are made in the image of God, then we can learn a lot about ourselves by looking at who God is. And we can be, our, be most ourselves. We can be most human when we're seeking to be most like our creator. Another huge implication for this teaching on God as creator is this. One of the questions that comes up is why is every human life important? One of the things I, I love about the discussion taking place in our culture right now is there's a discussion taking place about the value of human life. But what I want us to recognize is that the way that we view that is that Every human life is valuable, including the unborn, not because culture says it's valuable, but because God says it's valuable. Amen, church? And the reason why I, I think culture is getting it right right now is that every human life is valuable no matter their race or ethnicity or social status or economic status. Every human life is valuable and culture is getting that right, but it's not because it's, a, it's an evolved awakening. It's because God has been declaring this for thousands of years that every life matters because every life was made in the image of God. That's why these things matter. That's why human life matters. It's a huge implication. I think another important implication that comes up is this question is what is justice? Or why do we care so much about justice? Uh, let's all just be honest for a second. You know as well as I do that as soon as you get cut off in traffic, uh, there's something inside of you that rises up. Like there's, there's a justice meter in all of us. When something seems unfair, like all, immediately the, the blood begins to boil. And uh, if you didn't have Jesus in your life, things would be a lot different, right? Just acknowledge that. Um, same thing for you too, Andrew. I bet. I promise. I promise. But why is that there? That's the question. Why is there such a strong justice meter in every single one of us? And I promise you, it's not because culture tells us that's what's important. That's there because we come from and bear the image of a just God. Like, why do we even have a concept of justice in the first place? And the concept of justice in and of itself says that there are some things that are wrong and some things that are right. And if we're the, the final arbiter of what is right and wrong, then there's no universal stance of what is right and wrong. We're just blowing smoke but the reason we all believe that there is absolute right and wrong is because we come from a God who establishes moral authority. He establishes what is right and what is wrong. And God is a just God. Amen, church? That God is the one who establishes with our par without partiality, this is right, this is wrong, this is fair, this is not fair. 
God is a God of justice, and that for me is even further proof of this worldview that God is the creator and sustainer of all things. The reason we care so much about justice is because we are made in the image of a God who is just. I think one of the last questions, there's lots of other implications, but this is a huge one, I think, as we think about the world, is this question, is, is it our world or is it God's? Is the world our world or is it God's world? And I think the deepest questions of our hearts get answered in who God is and we understand who we are in light of that. And I think that the only proper response to all of this is this. The proper response, if we truly believe that God is the creator, is awe and reverence and worship for who God is. Proverbs 1, verse 7, says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There's awe, there's respect, there's fear, there's worship. This is not our world that we have made. This is God's world that he has made. And we are accountable to this God. Romans 1, 21 and 25 is a great and accurate description. This is written nearly 2,000 years ago, but it's no different than today. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served, what does it say? Created things rather than the creator. And we can see that happening in our world all around us. We're worshiping creation instead of worshiping the creator. How backwards is that? We're worshiping culture. We're worshiping politics. We're worshiping our own feelings. We're worshiping ourselves. We're worshiping the economy. We're worshiping creation instead of worshiping the one who made all of it in the first place. We're putting so much emphasis in worshiping all this stuff instead of worshiping the one who made all of this stuff. We are called to repent and believe. Right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your steps. We don't want to trust in our own understanding, but have a biblical worldview and view the world through the lens of who God is and what God says. Some questions and kind of statements as we wrap up. In the midst of this pandemic, are we in awe of how God has made the human immune system? Like, can we just pause for a second and we recognize the fear and the struggle and the chaos and the confusion around this topic? But can we just acknowledge for a minute how amazing the human body is and how amazing the immune system is that God has made, that there are viruses that seek to attack us and to basically kill us, but God has allowed us to have the immune system that fights that off. Amen, right? Praise God for that. Let's, let's worship the creator of that and not the creation. In the midst of a pandemic, can we worship God and be in awe of how God sustains us? Can we just look around and just go, wow, God, this, you're incredible that in the midst of all of this, we're doing well, we're healthy, or we're provided for, or we have family or friends, or we have technology. Let's just worship God, the creator of all of these things, and acknowledge how amazing he is. In the midst of the chaos that is American politics and civil unrest, can we just be in awe for a second of the fact that God runs everything and everything is in his hands. There is nothing that happens that God is not overseeing and in control of. I just want to challenge us when we sit down and enjoy life's simple pleasures and complexities 
and diversities or even life itself, can we pause for a moment and worship the God who made all of those things? What I love about, um, and I don't want to make this about this topic, there's so many other things, but what I love about the idea of race and ethnicity that I think gets lost is that if we're not careful, um, we'll see it simply as a problem that divides us, and I don't think God sees it that way. I think God sees it as something that is to be worshipped, that there's great diversity among us as human beings, and that's a part of God's creation, and we celebrate that, and we worship that, the way that God has made us and wired us, all valuable in his sight, part of God's plan and God's purpose. This was a couple years ago, and uh, I can remember it was winter time, just spending time with our daughters. I've got three daughters, and uh, just spending time with them. And I think we're out in the snow one day, just making snow angels. And uh, I'm not sure what snow angels are right now, but anyway, uh, but snow angels. And uh, just had a moment of awe and wonder, just saying, God, you are amazing. Just take that in, take those moments in. And allow yourself to be caught up in the worship of God, because God is our creator. Amen, church? Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that in these seasons, God, you would root us in the truth of your word. And God, that you would give us, God, a stronger, a greater perspective of a biblical world view. God, help us to step back for a moment and just acknowledge again that you are the creator of all things. God, you speak and the world comes into existence and we are made in your image. God, help us to be image bearers in the world. The love, the justice, the joy, the peace, all these things, God, are part of the image of who you are in us. And Jesus, we want to take a moment right now and worship your name. That a part of our story is sin, A part of our story and the story of the world is the fall, is choice, it's rebellion against the holy God, it's viewing ourselves as God, it's worshiping through the creation instead of the creator. God, we recognize that part of our story is salvation through Jesus, redemption through your son, perfect lamb, that died on the cross for our sins. God, we recognize that laws can't change a human heart, that our problem is a sin problem, but that you are a great God, not giving us what our sins deserve, but instead giving us grace. We receive that grace by faith in Jesus Christ. We recognize the power of the name of Jesus in our lives and in our world. We declare that name today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.